All right, we're on the marks of the church. Certain things which must be understood concerning the nature of the marks. The marks proceed from Christ himself as the author of the church. The first cause must be held to be the will of Christ and the operation of the Holy Ghost. For this reason, St. Thomas says, Christ himself, the Son of God, consecrates his church and seals it with the Holy Ghost as if with his own mark and seal. According to this connection with its root, which is Christ ordering and operating in the marks, let us contemplate the true church, which is the spiritual vine, which is discerned from every plant, which the celestial Father has not uh, planted, such as the Novus Ordo. All right. When you go through these marks, you have to th- think of the Novus Ordo uh, trying to present itself as the Catholic Church. Pachamama. The four marks are joined together in such a way that in their ultimate principle, which is the Holy Ghost, that if one should exist, the others must also be present. So if one is lacking, they are all lacking. because they all proceed from the same spirit of truth. Something just fell down. From the what? Oh, okay. So, um... Uh, three, since the marks are essential properties of the church, it is necessary that it have each of them positively. And it is never possible that an essential mark of the church be found really and formally in a false church. Really and formally, in the sense that there could be some aspects of it, but that you don't have the true uh, mark. As you could have some, you could, uh, some aspects of a mark. Like, for example, a material succession. Apost- apostolicity, in that sense. Or valid sacraments, a valid priesthood, a valid episcopacy. So, see, uh, that also pertains to apostolicity. All right, so... For we always understand the marks in a proper and Christian sense. For this reason, they are apt for the discernment of the Church of Christ from sects, such as the Novus Ordo. (laughs) The Novus Ordo does not deserve the name of sect materially, but it deserves the name of sect formally. In other words, it has all of the qualities of a sect in as much as it has, sect means to cut. It has cut from Catholic doctrine and, and Catholic practice. And, you see. So, and the only thing left in it is that, by default practically, that continuity of succession. That's the thesis anyway. Other false religions which cannot be called Christian, such as the error of Buddhism or Mohammedanism, are attacked by other arguments. For example, the expansion of those forms of pantheism which are contained under the vague and common name of Buddhism, since it does not even have a likeness materially to the mark of Catholicity, cannot even be compared to the Church's mark of Catholicity. Kat olein in Greek, or katole. Kat means according to, ole means whole, according to the whole. So you have one thing applied to many, that's Catholicity. So Catholicity presupposes unity of faith, unity of sacraments, unity of government, and it is applied to the whole world. That is not true of Buddhism. It is not true of Mohammedanism. 
5. For a prudent judgment concerning the truth of the church, it is not necessary that there be a complete knowledge of all the marks, but a knowledge which is founded and which is very simple in ignorant people is sufficient. Because it makes sense that if Christ founded a church, it's going to have these marks. I mean, they would know that confusedly. It's going to be holy. Everyone would believe the same thing. It, it would have a, uh, a government that, that is based on the apostles. In other words, there would be certain natural, we might say, uh, or demands. In other words, that, that you would say these things are, are, are very clearly signs of its divine institution. You don't have to take a De Ecclesia course to find out. For a prudent judgment concerning the truth of the church, it is not necessary that there be a complete knowledge of all the marks, but a knowledge which is founded and which is very simple and ignorant people is sufficient. Nevertheless, in order to defend the faith, a scientific tract is necessary. The false opinion of the Protestants concerning the marks. The Protestants, although, God bless you, they disagree with the Catholic Church on this matter, nevertheless boast their marks. Luther proposed seven marks about which St. Robert Bellarmine treats in his De Ecclesia Militante. Calvin said, wherever we see the word of God sincerely preached and heard, where the sacraments instituted by Christ administered, there is no doubt that in that place there is a church of God. Luther and other Protestants expressed themselves similarly. In England, the Protestant authors proposed as the unique or radical marks of the church the preaching of the pure word of God and the right preaching of the sacraments with regard to those things which are necessarily required according to the institutions of Christ. The obvious problem is, well, who's to say what the pure preaching is, what the right doctrine is? Who's to say? Therefore, having rejected the marks of the Council of Constantinople, they substitute two marks for the Catholic marks, namely the preaching of the pure word of God and to the correct administration of the sacraments. They can't even agree with what the sacraments are, are. The two marks of Protestantism are false. For one, in them that thing is held to be a principle when in fact it is the very th thing being sought. The pure word is known through the church. When the, the question is put to Protestants, which church preaches the pure word, that is, the true doctrine of Christ, they would respond nothing except that the true doctrine of Christ is preached in that church which preaches the pure word. <laughs> That's all they could say. This is not to point out Marx, but to fall into a vicious circle. The same is true concerning the other mark. Neither of the marks is obvious, for it is easier to know the fact of the true church than the pure word of the highest truths and correct administration of the sacraments in themselves and in particular. How do you know that this Protestant church is teaching the pure word and the one down the street is not teaching the pure word? Or you can enter into the absurdity of Protestantism that even though they are contradicting each other, nonetheless, they both have the pure word. Three, each note proposed against the doctrine of the old church seems to be excogitated more for the purpose of protecting the false church than of investigating the true one. So whether the church of Christ is one, what the mark of unity is. The mark of unity can be defined, the, the property of the church, by which in the profession of faith, in government and in worship, it is undivided in itself and divided from any other. So faith, government, worship. Undivided in itself and divided from any other. One, it is said to be a property, since we are speaking here not about a merely accidental unity, like a bag of marbles, one that is merely material and extrinsic, but an essential and formal unity which arises naturally from the constitutive elements of the church. See, so it's not just a, a jumble of things that happen to be together, but it, it's 
it's a, a unity just like a, an animal or a plant or, or anything living is a, has a unity to it. Two, we say in the profession of faith, since merely internal faith does not manifest the, the church. So for uh, it has, you have to pr profess the faith. It's one thing to have the faith. It's another thing to profess it. And you can sin against profession of faith. You can have the faith, but you can sin against profession of faith. For example, the Libelatici in the early church who would obtain the, the little books that said they, were, they had uh, offered incense to the gods were sinning against the profession of faith. They were not sinning against the faith. They believed. Otherwise, they would not have sought the, li the Libella, the little books but they were sinning against the profession of faith. In government, since the faithful who are a physical multitude are made into a moral unity only through authority. For in worship, that is primarily in the sacraments in which the essential worship is contained and secondarily in the accidental worship inasmuch as in the variety of ceremonies, one doctrine is expressed. So the church has no problem with variety of ceremonies. It always had it, even in the Western rites. The thing is that it must have a unity of doctrine that is expressed in those ceremonies. You have to distinguish between ritus and ceremonialia, or ceremoniae. Ritus means just the matter and form of the sacrament. And ceremonie means the uh, surrounding words, gestures, etc. Vestments, all sorts of things. Genuflections, liturgical acts. Which have as their duty to express the truth of what is going on. Otherwise, they are false and will have a very, very serious bad effect. That is, they will corrupt the faith of the people because the people, more than by any other means that the church uses, either by catechism or by preaching, the people learn from those ceremonies. So it's not merely some window dressing or or lace on the, the end of your handkerchief, the ceremonies. They're very, very important. And that's why they must be preserved very, very carefully. Because they are the fruit of the church's contemplation and years and years of approval, of approval and rejection. So it is, it is a, a something, a, a, you know, a, but th that's the technical terms when you see that the ritus only refers to the, to the actual matter and form of the sacrament. But sometimes these things are used, uh, ritus or rites, especially in English, is, is used promiscuously, with meaning the ceremonies, the rites, you know. So the Eastern Rites, for example, that would refer to their ceremonies as well as everything else. See, but that's strictly speaking, Latin especially. So, I'm gonna leave off. Yes, th so that's number four. Five, these three things must be taken together and formally Together, since they only together do they, since they only together do, do they manifest the one and entire church, 
formally since it is necessary that the material fact be joined to the firm, stable, and constitutive principle of unity. In the unity of creed, hierarchy, and liturgy, the church is undivided in itself and divided from any other. So any one of those taken apart does not constitute the unity of the church. See, so, you know, if some heretic is using the, the Missali Romanum, which some Anglicans do, that doesn't constitute them as being part of the church. Leo XIII said, amongst these, the distinguishing characteristics of the church, the most worthy of our chief consideration is unity. This the divine author impressed on it as a lasting sign of truth and of unconquerable strength. And that has completely disappeared in the Novus Ordo. There is no unity of faith. either amongst themselves or in continuity with the past because the unity must be not only horizontal, that is everybody believing, but it also must be vertical in the sense that you have to have continuity with the past in doctrine. It's one church through all ages so even amongst themselves, unity of faith is com has completely disappeared in the Novus Ordo. You can believe whatever you want. I mean, as I said yesterday, the, the head of Not Notre Dame University was praising same-sex marriages. I mean, imagine if he had done that under the reign of St. Pius X. What the reaction in Rome would have been. But that is unpunished, and the fact that authority leaves it unpunished is a sign that they approve it. Because as a general principle, qui tacet consentire videtur. He who is silent seems to consent. And that's true of anybody. But Merkelbach says it, that consent is presumed in authority if authority does not correct an abuse. It is presumed, legitimately presumed. Because authority has as its very purpose the direction of the, of the uh, community. For example, ordinarily you can fly by the police at 80 miles an hour on the freeway on 75. All right. The fact that they if, uh, tolerate that in general is a sign that they consent to it. I don't think anybody has ever gotten the ticket for that. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> People are going a lot faster than 80 even. But the, you know, that, that, um, that's, is, that's the, the enforcement is essential in law. And enforcement is one of the interpretations of law. Because many laws become obsolete, and they're no longer enforced because they are obsolete. Or they're not enforced because of particular circumstances. Because law cannot foresee all circumstances. See, so the, the, the failure to correct 
in authority is the presumption that they consent. So it's just destroyed. That's a very, very strong argument against the Novus Ordo, is that the unity of faith is gone. It is, it is, it is not Catholic because it lacks that. Pachamama, that there's an idol in St. Peter's Basilica. I mean, what else do you want? Or just uh, Bergoglio uh, giving a whole expl Lutheran explanation of justification. Perfectly Lutheran. Luther would have applauded it. Been jealous that he did not think it of himself. It's so clear. Spam risk. Um, so that's very important, all right? And he says that the most worthy of our, uh, uh, of our chief consideration is unity. This, the divine author impressed on it as a lasting sign of truth and of unconquerable strength. And of all, of unity of government and unity of faith and unity of sacraments, the most important is the unity of faith because the other two depend on the faith. You know the government through the faith. You know that Peter received the power to rule from the faith. You know that our Lord is present in the Blessed Sacrament from the faith. So of all three of those, the unity of faith is the most important. So that was from Satis. Is that the elect that must be the hot water people? Uh, so that's from Satis Conitum. Satis Conitum was uh, issued actually at the time when there was the consideration of the approval of the Anglican orders, and there was a lot of discussion as to whether somehow the Anglicans could be considered part of the true Church. And yeah, there was a lot of discussion about that. And so Leo the Thirteenth issued this in 1896, uh, also because Vatican I never got to the tract on the church. And this was a way of explaining the doctrine of the church. That schema of Vatican I is excellent. The, the Vatican I schema on the church. And it, it, uh, it would have cleared up, so you could not have had a Vatican II with that schema. It, it's talked about everything. Yes. I have it in Latin. I don't think it, well, I had somebody translate it into English, actually. I think I have it someplace in English. So anyway. All right, the true notion of the unity of faith. By faith, we do not mean confidence, as the Protestants would say, but the assent of the intellect to truths revealed by God. Very important. Ascent. The faith can be considered either as a habit by which we believe, and in this way faith is one in species and differs by number in diverse people. So it's the same habit in, in the whole church. In other words, everyone has the same virtue of faith. It can also be considered objectively, and in this way there is one faith. You see, the, the, you the distinguish between, in English, commonly, the word faith with a small f indicates the habit or act of faith. Faith with a capital F means faith objectively uh, considered. That means as it is the collection of truths which must be believed. The faith, the Catholic faith.
Not everyone observes that, but that is common. The formal object of faith is first truth. The formal object is what makes the act to be what it is. First truth, and by adhering to this, we believe whatever is contained under faith. So first, first truth is God, God revealing. The unity of faith is manifested in as much as all the faithful profess their adherence to one and the same object of faith. For this reason, if we want to dis discern the mark of unity in faith correctly, these two things must be understood. One, although one person, according to his conditions and circumstances, might believe explicitly more truths than another, say like the priests of Lourdes versus St. Bernadette, who didn't know too much. Nevertheless, it is necessary that each one believe implicitly all things and be prepared to believe explicitly all things if he knew all things. See, so you are disposed to believe anything that pertains to faith, and that's sufficient for the virtue of faith. Two, this implicit faith is manifested externally as an element of the mark of unity. If all explicitly admit a certain evident principle by which they adhere to the whole faith. So I believe whatever the Catholic whatever God has revealed and the Catholic Church has proposed for belief. Three, this principle is none other than the supreme authority. For this reason, St. Thomas teaches the unity of the church is found in two things namely in the connection of the members of the church with one another, or communion, and secondly, in the order of all the members of the church to one head. All right. Ratzinger tried to make the church number one, but neglected number two, because he, in his document, the church seen as communion, See, he called the schismatic churches particular churches. And wherever the valid Eucharist is celebrated there, this is a quote, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church of the Creed is present. So if you have a valid Eucharist, so you have communion then. So that means, see, a particular church in Catholic theology is a diocese, that is a, a church of a particular area, which is dependent upon and subject to the Roman pontiff. And it has all of its legitimacy from the fact that it is dependent upon and subject to the Roman pontiff. If it cuts itself off from the Roman pontiff, it is like a branch that has been cut off from a vine that full, and this is an image of one of the fathers, I forget, like, like a, a vine, a grapevine that falls to the ground and rots, but still has in its rotted state a type of uh, similarity with what it was originally. So you see rotten branches at the bottom of every plant. It has a certain similarity to what it was originally but it's cut off, it has no life, it is unable to give life or bear fruit. And I forget what I think it's St. Augustine. You see, so to call a schismatic church a particular church is intrinsically contrary to the unity of the Catholic Church. It's heresy. But he's, he's, the, he's the man, you know. He's, he'll save the church. When, when Bergie croaks, then he'll come back and he'll save the church because he really believes in the Catholic faith. Get those miters out, get those shoes, and that velvet half cape, and then you've got everything. Those little red shoes are the key. <laughs> This is the man that was in a suit and tie at Vatican II, which at the time, I lived during that time, 
was scandalous for a priest to be in. Scandal if you saw a priest in a suit and tie. He, Kung and Runner, like three devils, were in suits and tie at that thing. And they essentially operated the, that council, those radicals. And now he's, he was walking around in the pretty red shoes and the, the red cape and the hat. He knew exactly what he was doing. Because he knew that Vatican II would fail if it manifested the fact that it was rupture. He knew that. He was smart enough to know that. That the thing would historically fail. And he, ha he was grasping at straws, in my opinion, to give a, an aspect of continuity. And that's why he permitted the traditional Latin mass to flourish. That gives it the stamp of tradition. See, we're one with, you see, the two, two forms of the mass. You see, they're both the same, but just one, you know, two forms. He had to have the stamp of tradition. And that's why he lifted the excommunication on SSPX, hoping to get them in and, and to, to have tradition along with him and it, with his reform. And that's why, in my opinion, it, it, is a, it is a, that idea of giving them that stamp of tradition it is, is the work of the devil. They need to be denounced. They need to leave the Vatican in shame. And they should not have the approval of anyone who is retaining the Catholic faith. So, anyway. This is an interesting course, <laughs> very topical, all right? So, um, so uh, da, 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 da. from this, it can be understood that there is an indis indissoluble link between the unity of faith and the authority of the Roman pontiff. Indissoluble link, which shows his role that his primary purpose is the protection and promulgation of the Catholic faith. That's his primary thing to do because everything else depends on it. Sacraments, his very authority depends on the faith. See, so if he does not have that intention to preserve and promulgate the Catholic faith, he, he intrinsically destroys his papacy, his authority, because it pertains to authority essentially to intend to uh, I would say, uh, preserve and, and, pro and promote the essential ends of the community over which it is set. Imagine if the police took an oath to help criminals to murder and steal and rob banks. We will help them, we will open doors for them, and we'll do everything we can to help criminality. I so swear. You would say, these are not police. These are criminals themselves. Or if a soldier said, I will do everything I can to help the enemy. <laughs> if that was their oath, what would you say about that? That the whole army is there to protect the enemy and to, to hand over the, the interests of the country to the enemy. Do you, do you, that's why the police take oaths. That's why congressmen and, and legislators take oaths. Uh, that's why the military takes oaths. Judges take oaths. Doctors take oaths. In order to confirm their intention to see to the common good 
of, of whatever they're placed over, their, their particular good in each case. See, and that's why popes take oaths. That's why subdeacons take the anti-modernistic oath. That's why you recite the credo at your ordination. <laughs> So the the um, um, so that, that's you know just sort of a footnote to what how it applies to our present age. So the fictitious unity of the fundamental arg articles, Jurieux. Now look at Jurieux. Pierre Jurieux was a French Protestant leader mostly 17th century. He was born at Mer in Orléonais, in this little south of Paris, where his father was a Protestant pastor. He studied in the Academy of Saumur, in the, uh, in the Academy of Sedan. Every, everybody that's famous, Sedan. <laughs> so I didn't know what happened at Sedan. That's where the French in 1870, 70 or 71, I think 71, had a disastrous defeat at the hands of the Prussians in the Franco-Prussian War, Sedan. And that's where they captured the emperor. So that was a real bad day. Uh, it's in the northeast part of France. And when Sedan fell in the Second World War, the French lost all of their, that was like the end of the war because Sedan fell. It was so, such a, uh, a shock, <laughs> like a, an emotional shock to them. <clears throat> anyway, Academy of Sedan under his grandfather Pierre du Moulin and other under Leblanc de Beaulieu. After completing his studies in the Netherlands, <laughs> for those of you who are not used to my courses, Holland traditionally has been in Europe the I'll use a, a kind word, the meeting place of all of the intellectual trash of Europe, all right? Holland was uh, revolted against Spain in order to be the, a, a Protestant country. So early on, you see, it became this free-thinking liberal place in reaction to Spain. Spain held on to Belgium, what is presently Belgium. Right, so it, what, it attracted all of the intellectual trash of Europe because it was so liberal. You could get away with saying anything there. So the fact that they, all, they, they always show up in Holland at a certain point. Descartes went to Holland. The Puritans went to Holland because they got kicked out of England because they were anti-royal. So they went over to Holland, then they got kicked out of Holland, and then they came to this country. And they were supposed to go to New Jersey. They, yeah, that's true. But the, because there's shoals between, if you go around Massachusetts to New Jersey, around Long Island, there are shoals. Shoals are rocky, you know, shallow rocks in the, in the water. And so the, because it was not all you know, mapped out, the captain said, I don't want to go around to New Jersey. You're going to stay here in Massachusetts. So they ended up in Massachusetts. Yes, but they were, New Jersey was supposed to get them. So anyway. Uh, Jurier was ordained as an Anglican priest. Returning to France, he was ordained again and, <laughs> and succeeded his father as pastor of the church at Mer, where they were Calvinists in France. Soon after this, he published his first work, Examen des Livres de la Réunion de Christianisme. Notice that. Uh, examination of the book of the Reunion of Christi Christianity. See, the Protestants have been talking about that since day one because they have broken up into so many different sects. So it's like Humpty Dumpty trying to put the thing back together. In 1674, Traité de la Dévotion led to his appointment as professor of theology and, and Hebrew at Sedan, where he soon became pastor. A year later, he, he published his Apologie pour la morale des réformés. <laughs> he, 
His reputation was damaged by his argumentative nature, which sometimes descended into fanaticism. Despite his sincerity, he was called by his adversaries the Goliath of the Protestants. You know what happened to Goliath. On the suppression of the Academy of Sedan in 1681, all right, that's when uh, Louis XIV kicked out all of the uh, Protestants from France. Jurieu received an invitation to a church at Rouen, but after, afraid to remain in France on account of his forthcoming work, La Politique du Clergé de France, he went to Holland and was pastor of the Walloon Church of Rotterdam till his death. He was also professor at the École Illustre. So that's Pierre Jurieu. He's, he's a personality in history, Pierre Jurieu. In the church history. So, so, all right, we'll have to wait until tomorrow for to hear more about Pierre Jurieu. It's today's day.